Hello and welcome to Deusai, where we explore the science of living well as intended. I'm a lawyer. Actually, I'm a litigator, which means I'm the kind of lawyer who goes to court. In court, often each side has an expert and they don't agree. It's my job to make sense of what the experts have to say and explain it simply so the decision maker knows what he or she needs to to make a good decision. That's what we do here. We explain what you need to know to make a good decision. Go potty. Oh, no, no, no. We don't need to go potty. Let's start with what you need to know about nutritional recommendations. Doctors' eating advice will constantly change. One day, you'll see a study about wine that says that it's good for you. And the next day, you'll see another study that says that it's bad for you. In fact, entire ways of eating are in constant debate. You might one day hear from some experts that say you should be eating entirely vegetables, and the next day from experts who indicate that you should be eating entirely carnivore, entirely meat. How is that possible? Well, this video explains something that doctors have known for a long time, but rarely mention. And that is that the vast majority of long-term eating advice comes from fairly bad science. That is to say it comes from primarily epidemiology. And that's not to say that all epidemiology is bad. It's just not a very reliable science and only should be relied upon when two things are present. And usually they aren't. This is a long time issue that continually resurfaces. It resurfaced most recently at the very highest level in an October 2022 edition of the journal Nature. For those who aren't familiar, the journal Nature is the very most prestigious of places to publish a scientific article. If you have a wonderful scientific article, you want to publish there more than any place else because it only takes the best of the best. Now, this particular paper was an editorial about a University of Washington project. The University of Washington Medical School ranks number one in the country for primary care. And this was an editorial about a University of Washington Medical School project or a group that was performing a project in review of various eating recommendations, like the recommendation that people not eat very much red meat and the recommendation that people eat lots of vegetables. And the finding was that there really isn't very much evidence to support those recommendations. Those are weak recommendations. And the editorial went on to indicate that eating studies need to get a whole lot better or the general public will simply stop believing the supposed experts. And that is perhaps the best kept secret within the medical community, that these long-term eating recommendations really aren't based on very good evidence. Perhaps the best known scientific article on this topic was a 1995 publication in the journal Science. Again, for those who aren't familiar, the journal Science is the longtime rival of the journal Nature and very prestigious place to publish. And this particular editorial was entitled Epidemiology Faces Its Limits. It was an editorial about various epidemiologists' feelings on when epidemiology simply isn't reliable enough. And the article indicated that for epidemiology to really be counted, you need to have two factors present. You need to, number one, see that there are very large magnitude changes when your variable is present. You need to be seeing changes in tens of percent, maybe beginning with 30, then 40, 50, 60 percent, just to begin seeing that epidemiology might be reliable enough. And secondly, you need to see that these same very large magnitude changes are present when you repeat the studies in other and very large populations. What is epidemiology? It's the study of a population as it is. You're not experimenting on the population. You're simply observing it and trying to find correlations. And from those correlations, try to determine causation. For example, you might submit surveys to 100,000 people about smoking. Now, you wouldn't be telling certain people you should smoke and you shouldn't smoke. You'd just be asking, do you smoke? And then following up on their health consequences. From these kinds of studies, scientists have been able to determine that when people smoke, they are at greatly increased risks of certain kinds of airway cancers, as much as a 30,000% increase in some of those cancers. And so we know with a fair degree of certainty, based on this kind of epidemiological evidence, that Smoking probably does cause or at least greatly increase the risk of those cancers. And there's a beautiful aspect to epidemiology. It is perhaps the only way that we can get this kind of long-term information of the effects of various things on people's long-term health. We aren't mice. 
We're not willing to live our lives like lab rats in a tightly controlled experiment. The problem with epidemiology is that it doesn't have the tightly controlled precision of a tightly controlled clinical study. There are various sources of error. The study of meat is perhaps the best example. If you were to do a search on PubMed, you'd find over 100,000 articles on whether meat is healthy or unhealthy. Some of them say that meat is healthy, some say that it's not healthy. And the fact that people continually publish on this same topic means that it's a hot debate. Most of these papers are epidemiological and show small percentage increases in heart problems and cancer issues for people who eat heavy amounts of meat. But those are primarily based out of Western countries. If you were to perform those same observational studies in other parts of the world, sometimes you get very different results. For example, if you were to look in China, the people who live in Hong Kong are the longest lived in the entire world, and they eat lots of meat. The fact that you get different results depending on where you perform the study suggests that there are some errors present. What would be some of the errors? Well, the number one error that people hypothesize is what's called an unhealthy user bias. An unhealthy user bias is the idea that if people in the Western countries, meaning the United States and Europe, if they have been told for many generations that meat probably isn't great for them in terms of their health, and yet they continue to eat large amounts of meat, that puts them in a group of people who are likely to do other kinds of unhealthy things. That's the same group of people that would be more likely to smoke, more likely to drink, less likely to exercise, more likely to do steroids. And so, of course, that group of people is going to be more likely to have heart problems or perhaps colon cancer or various other kinds of cancer. At least historically, China hasn't had that same bias against eating meat. There may be some that's creeping in from the West, but for the most part, these people who are meat eaters in Hong Kong don't suffer from that same unhealthy user bias. If you've ever read a study of this kind, then you probably know that researchers try to statistically control for these known sources of error. But that isn't very easy to do, and arguably it can't be done. You see, it's very difficult to take what is already inaccurate information and then improve it with yet more inaccurate information. You might think Western epidemiology may not be all that accurate, but it's still the best we've got, right? There's good reason to think otherwise. For example, if you were to look at a 2022 study of entire world meat consumption, that's something that some researchers did out of Australia, and they used UN agency data for 175 regions across the entire globe. Now, of course, if you're looking at the entire globe, it eliminates many sources of error. Number one, it eliminates error based upon the region that you're studying. Number two, it eliminates errors that might be based upon smaller sample size. After all, if you're looking at the world, it's arguably the largest possible sample size. And three, if what you're doing is looking at total meat consumption for a region and then just dividing by the number of people in a population, then that eliminates errors that would be part of questionnaires. If you're asking people to remember how much meat they eat on average in a given month over the course of the last several years, there's likely to be some inaccuracy there quite a bit of inaccuracy, as many studies have shown. And then, of course, these researchers attempted to make statistical adjustments to compensate for various expected sources of error. For example, they tried to factor in that some places have less access to food in general, and other places have less access to health care or maybe to education. And after making those statistical adjustments, they still found a fairly straight line indicating that the more meat people eat, the longer they live. There are also many experts who say that eating meat actually protects against these various concerns. It protects against the possibility of having heart problems and cancer-related issues. For example, a doctor by the name of Ofadia is not only a heart surgeon, he is the author of the number one book on Amazon on heart health. And he indicates that it's not meat that is causing heart problems. And in fact, he recommends eating as much red meat as possible. He says that no, it is the sugar and carbs causing the problems. You could also look at Dr. Youssef. He's the former head of the World Heart Federation, and he was the most cited cardiologist in the entire world 
back in 2020. That means he's the guy who other people in the scientific community are often looking to when they want information about heart health. And he basically agrees with Dr. Ovadia that it's not meat that's the problem, it's carbohydrates. He famously said at a large convention that if you go to a fast food restaurant, go ahead and eat a burger, just throw away the bun. Meat, of course, isn't the only example of this kind of bad science. For example, you could look at low-carb dieting. Epidemiology in the West shows at least slightly increased risks of heart problems and all-cause mortality among people who are eating these kinds of low-carbohydrate diets. But it's a small enough amount that it's basically to be expected within epidemiology. After all, these are also the same kinds of people who are probably choosing to eat this because maybe they were obese or pre-diabetic, essentially that they had years of calcification in their arteries, and that's why they chose to eat this diet and hopefully lose weight. That calcification would remain in their arteries for many, many years and even decades after they start eating a healthier diet. And their risk of having those kinds of heart problems and of passing away from various conditions remains high during those decades. This doesn't mean that you should ignore science, but there are certain recommendations that you should question namely long-term eating recommendations. We aren't lab rats. We're not going to be willing to live our lives in long-term controlled experiments. Though we'll use various proxies to try to understand the effects of various things on our long-term health, we may never know the long-term effects of things like drinking red wine or eating chocolate, eating copious amounts of red meat, eating vegetables, or eating a low-carbohydrate diet. That is why so many doctors disagree on these kinds of topics. In the next video, we'll explore the bad science that you and your doctors should consider. Thanks for watching.